As I continue to grow as a woodworker, I'll often try to build furniture or cabinet pieces that incorporate new techniques and methods. I like to challenge myself by doing something I've never done before. In this case, I'm building a drop leaf side table as a gift for my mother-in-law. The drop leaves will have a rule joint. When the drop leaf is extended, this joint makes a tight, well-supported connection, while in the down position, the rule joint makes an appealing roundover that conceals the hinges and transitions well into the center portion of the tabletop. I'm using quarter sawn sapile for this build, which has a beautiful ribbon figure running with the grain. I first cross cut the stock to rough length at the miter saw and then the rough width at the band saw. Any internal stresses within the boards will likely release as they're being cut into more manageable pieces, which will be taken care of during the milling process. I first rip the aprons for the side table and then adjust the fence of the bandsaw to rip the legs. Again, these are all rough cuts and oversized by anywhere between an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. I'll then go to the joiner to flatten one face and one perpendicular edge, and then plane down to final thickness and width. I get a lot of folks interested in planer joiner combo machines ask me how much of a nuisance is it to switch between jointing and planing. And in my case, as a one person shop, it's a non-issue. I batch out all my parts on the jointer before switching into planing mode. It takes all but a minute to switch over. As I run material through the planer, I like to gang together multiples of the same part. It saves a little bit of time and gives me a really consistent product. I also milled up some test pieces out of some spare poplar that I had in my shop. I try to always make a couple test pieces for fitting joinery and whatnot. Finally, once everything is square and parallel from the milling process, I crosscut the parts on the table saw with my crosscut sled. And now it's time for joinery. I'm using mortise and tenon to join the aprons to the legs, and I first lay out the mortises using my marking gauge and a setup block. The cutting edge of the marking gauge gives me a really consistent line that I can bury my chisels into. I also make sure that I'm always referencing off of the same face of each part during joinery layout. And here I'm using a planing stop to reference off of the top of the legs to mark the shoulders of the mortises. To machine the mortises, I'm using a quarter inch Forstner bit at the drill press. I drill the bounds of the mortises, making sure I allow the waste to clear out of the hole before plunging to full depth. This gives me a much cleaner hole. This would have also been made a lot easier and more repeatable if I had set up a couple of stop blocks along the fence of my drill press table. A lesson for next time, I guess. I'll then bore between those two bounds, removing as much waste as possible. At the bench, I'm using my inset tail vise to clamp down the legs. I first chop down the shoulders of the mortise to sever the cross grain. This ensures as I chop along the cheeks with the grain, fibers don't splinter off and mar my well-defined shoulder lines. I'm always chopping half the distance to the scribe line until I have no choice but to bury my chisel into the scribe line. The resistance from the waste material can often push against the bevel of the chisel and you'll start to make the mortise wider than you want. And there you have it, a clean mortise machined with the drill press and chisels. Again, I'm using the technique of ganging similar parts together to batch out a process and get a consistent result. The ends of the aprons are butt up against my planing stop and clamped together to scribe the shoulders of the tenons with the marking gauge. I often hear that one of the knocks against using a saw stop table saw is the fact that you have to switch to a dado break when using a dado set. While it is an extra step, it literally takes me 11 seconds for this one extra step. If I was a production shop, maybe that would be an issue if you're constantly switching between a traditional blade and dado set. That being said, the dado break is an extra part that you need to purchase. To cut the tenons, I'm using a dado stack sized to 3 quarters of an inch and set to a height of 3 eighths of an inch. While my tenons are 7 eighths of an inch long, there's no need for me to cut them in a single pass. I'm using my dado sled that has a pretty hefty stop block to cut the tenons in two passes. I built this dado sled after watching Daryl Peart's DVD on green and green design elements. Daryl did not show how his dado sled was built in the DVD. I simply reverse engineered his sled through visual inspection. It works well, and I also use it to produce green and green style finger joints. All right, time for a test fit and dry assembly. A nice friction fit is what I'm looking for. Some glue and clamps will make for a very strong joint. You probably noticed that the legs seem long for a side table. 
I purposely kept them long because I wanted to fit them accordingly to the brass square tapered cup casters that I used from House of Antique Hardware. Once I figured out how much the legs needed to be recessed into the cup casters, I cut the legs down to size and applied a four-sided taper. I'm using a shop-made tapering jig that I built years ago from an article in Fine Woodworking Magazine. The jig rides along the table saw fence with a cleat that's captured within a bracket. I first line up the tapers for the two adjacent tapered sides and clamp it down for the cut. For the remaining two tapered sides, I need to double the angle of the fence. Finally, I need to machine the secondary taper to fit the cup casters onto the legs. This is best done at the bench with a block plane. Just slowly remove material on all four sides until you get a nice friction fit. The cup casters are a nice functional touch and the brass contrasts well with the sapile. Next, I started working on the drop leaf tabletop. I laid out the configuration for the tabletop and glued up the center panel off camera. In order to produce the rule joint, I used a matched set of router bits that consists of a filleted roundover and cove bit. I first machined the filleted roundover on the center panel. Even though these are top bearing bits, I used the router fence aligned with the bearing for additional support along the edge of the workpiece. I also use these stock guides made by Jessem to keep the workpiece flat on the router table and tight against the fence. I'm taking multiple passes to cut this edge profile, incrementally increasing the bit height after each pass to ensure a clean, chatter-free, tear-out-free end product. The same process is done with the cove portion of the drop leaves, taking multiple passes and incrementally increasing the bit height after each pass. Once the rule joint profiles are cut, I need to machine the hinge mortises. I'm using Rockler's drop leaf hinges for shaped edges. In order for them to work properly, the center of the hinge knuckle needs to be mortised and centered on the fillet of the rule joint. To do this, I made a template that routes both the mortise for the hinge leaves and the knuckle. I first aligned the template with the drop leaf crease and placed a knuckle spacer within the template. I used a 3 8 inch router bushing and quarter inch mortising bit to route the channel for the hinge knuckle. Once that was done, I could remove the knuckle spacer and using a bottom bearing pattern bit, I routed out the mortise for the hinge leaves. I used the template again to establish the corners with a chisel and then removed the template to complete the cleanup process. When it was all done, I was able to produce a snug fitting hinge mortise. And then using a self-centering drill bit, I screwed in the hinge leave screws. Now as you can hear, there is a little bit of friction between the joint, so I had to remove the hinges and sand the cove portion slightly to remove the friction between the mating joints. Once I had the drop leaf hinges functioning properly, I needed to think about the overall shape of the tabletop. I made a mock-up of the shape I wanted out of cardboard and I transferred that shape onto two pieces of Baltic birch plywood to make templates, a shallow curve for the short side and a deeper curve for the long side. I then roughed out the shape of the curve on the bandsaw, making sure to leave the pencil line. I then smoothed and fared the curve of the templates at the bench using a spoke shave and a sanding block. I transferred the curve onto my tabletop with the hinges still attached to the drop leaves. I roughed out the shape of the table with a jigsaw. I then used the template to pattern route a thumbnail edge profile on the router table. For the long side, I double stick taped an extra strip behind the template to keep the drop leaves from moving during the routing operation. This was a pretty hefty bit, so I turned down my router motor speed and took multiple small passes until the full profile was machined. A light sanding with a sanding block removed any leftover machine marks. 
To support the drop leaves in the up position, I'm using telescoping extension arms. To do this, I needed to cut offset notches within the long side aprons. Using a flat bottom box joint blade, I cut out 3 quarter inch square notches using the cross cut sled on my table saw. Before I could install the extension arms, I used a flush mount drill bit to install the skirt washers to the aprons. The skirt washers allow the tabletop to expand and contract with seasonal changes while still keeping it attached to the aprons. I like using threaded inserts and machine screws within the tabletop. I think it gives the piece a cleaner look and it's less likely to strip out and mar the workpiece as time goes on. To keep the extension arms in line, I need to make a bracket. Again, I'm back at the crosscut sled on my table saw with a flat bottom box joint blade. At the drill press, I counterbored two holes for screws within the bracket, and with everything in place, I pre-drill holes in the tabletop and attach the bracket. There are two more things left to do before I can sand and apply finish, and that's to apply the brass insert knobs and pull stops on the extension arms. To make the wooden plugs within the insert knobs, I'm using a tapered plug cutter on the drill press. To release those plugs, I cut them out on the bandsaw and then glue them into the insert knobs using epoxy. To shape the plugs, I use a rasp, sandpaper, and 4 aught steel wool to polish on the drill press. To attach the knobs, I screw in a machine screw into the end of the extension arm and cut off the head. And then finally I glue on a 3 16 inch stop on the other end of the extension arm and secure it with a countersunk screw. Now it's time to apply finish. I sanded everything down to 220 grit with my orbital sander and lightly broke the edges with a soft sanding block. With the tenons taped off and everything disassembled, I apply a waterborne reactive sealer called Hydro Lacquer Plus. The sealer is designed to react with the tenons within the wood to create a warm oil look. I then apply a top coat called Polyway, which is made using whey protein, a byproduct of cheese making. Both of these products are made by Vermont Natural Coatings. After three coats of clear top coat, I glue up the legs and apron. Next, I reassemble the leaves. And then drill and screw the cup casters. Finally, I install the extension arm and reattach the tabletop to the apron. There you have it, a drop leaf table with tapered legs and brass casters. Thanks for watching.